Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson 62 of the platform specific series of my Z80 programming tutorials. We're back on the Amstrad CPC once again because it's the system I grew up with, and today we're going to be looking at the mouse. Now, this is for a game I'm working on, uh, which will hopefully be um, coming out soon, but um, I needed mouse control because that's what the game desired, and so that's what I had to figure out how to do. Now, the Amstrad CPC had something known as the AMX mouse, and this also worked on the ZX Spectrum. And what it does is it actually connects to the joystick port and it sort of works like a joystick in the sense that if you move the mouse up it sends a bunch of up commands to the joystick port as if the joystick's being pressed up. What this means is that you can actually have any game, any normal joystick game, and you can sort of control it with the mouse. I say sort of because the problem is that you might not be moving as fast as you need to. So the problem is basically just because the game will work doesn't mean it works very well. And I wanted sort of a normal mouse movement of a cursor for this game I'm writing. And um, basically you wouldn't get fast enough movement and smooth enough movement to do that. And so what I've done for my example today is I've created an interrupt handler and that interrupt handler will process the joystick it will process the movements of the joystick and then use those movements to update a cursor position and it will also handle the um, reading of fire buttons and um, I've made this into a little example that you can see um, running away on an animated gif here um, and the, the example will allow the cursor to move you can press the fire button sorry the left mouse button um, it is literally the fire button and that will draw a chibiko the character you can see there and if you click and drag then it will drag a um, series of blobs and that's what today's example will do and so the uh, it's a combination of um, a mouse reading routine and a simple example to make it work anyway let's go over to the code and let's see it in action so here is the code we're going to be running today on the cpc need to wait for my emulator to fire up it's a bit small it's from when I was capturing animated gifs there okay so the, the, the mouse is already enabled if it wasn't we would just need to go to settings and input and make sure enable AMX mouse was selected now you can see that there's not a sort of one-to-one -one mapping so um, the, my Windows mouse cursor and the game mouse cursor don't match but that's the way it works so if I click you can see we are drawing a Chibico and if I click and drag you can see we're drawing a kind of blob line there just to, just an example of the clicks now this example is only using left mouse but you could modify the code to use right mouse and actually the AMX mouse I believe had a middle mouse which used fire button 3 of the joystick port and that is an undocumented fire button and it's a bit tricky because it works fine on the original CPCs the 4646128 and that lot but on the plus machines it does not work so CPC plus CPC 61 to 8 plus GX4000 do not read the extra button so um, just something to bear in mind there anyway the example we're doing today is just a single fire button so it doesn't really matter anyway let's have a look at our code now as I say for speed and the smoothness of movement and also of course because if our game starts getting slow we still want the cursor to move at the same um, speed we don't want the mouse to start feeling like it's dragging because just because the game gets slow so we're using an interrupt handler and that's what we're enabling here so we're writing to memory address 38 here, 0038, and that is the interrupt handler call. Uh, we're putting a jump command, which is hexadecimal C3, and then the address of our interrupt handler. And it's our interrupt handler that's going to be doing all the work today. Now you can see we've got a command called read joystick here, because as I say, the mouse is working as a joystick, and it did so on the spectrum as well. I believe there's an AMSX mouse for the BBC, and I don't know how that worked. I, I suspect it was different. I'm not really sure about that one. But um, anyway, this one is a joystick. So this is a piece of code. It's modified from the keyboard reading example I had before. But we're just reading from a single um, line of the keyboard, line 49 here. And that is the one that the joystick is on. And you can see here, this is line 49 of the keyboard matrix. So bit 0 is up, bit 1 is down, bit 2 is left, bit 3 is right, 4 is fire 1, five is fire two and six will be fire three the undocumented mystery fire so that's what we've got so this is all just setting up the ay port so we can read in the fire buttons and then the directions and they will be stored in h when this finishes so that's what we're doing there so um we've got our sprite routines there we'll have a look at those in a moment so here's our reading of the joystick we're transferring h into d because we're going to use hl for our directions as we're doing movements now the game code is using a sprite routine based on the simple sprite series it's been slightly modified this version is using XOR so instead of um, p setting and anything it's XORing it and what that means is if we draw the same sprite twice 
the second draw will remove the first one completely. And that's very handy for our mouse cursor because that means we don't have to worry about remembering what was under it and redrawing it. That's why we're doing that. It's also nice and fast, so that's, that's the change that's happened there. Now, the routine here is working in bytes horizontally, so our coordinates are 80 wide and 200 tall, which is a bit um, lopsided to say the least. And so to compensate for this, I'm using 16-bit X and Y coordinates in the mouse routines. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the top byte of those 16-bit pairs for our X and Y coordinates when we draw to the screen. And this means that we can move, uh, for example, one quarter X coordinate for every one Y coordinate when we read and process from the mouse. That's that's why I'm using 16-bit values here. So we've got our keys from our mouse directions, and then we're loading in the current Y position, and we're loading in a move size here, which is 512, and you can change this if you want the mouse to be slower or faster. So that's what we've done there. And then we're going to check bit zero, which is up. If it's not up, we're going to skip. If the up key is pressed, we're checking the position of the mouse cursor. If the mouse cursor is already at the top of the screen, we don't want to move up again. So we're just skipping in that case. But if it's not at the top of the screen, we're subtracting our move speed in BC from HL. And that's why we had to move H to D here, because we needed HL. So that's moving us up the screen. We're then doing the same for down the screen here, checking the bottom of the screen, seeing if the cursor is right at the bottom. And if it's not, we're adding it to move the cursor down. And then we're doing basically the same for left and right here. Now, the only difference is that our move speed is much smaller. And that's because our vertical coordinate is in lines and our horizontal coordinate is not in pixels, it's in bytes. So um, we, we're having to move at a much slower speed. We're moving at a quarter of the speed there to compensate. And that gives us a nice even movement. So our moves of the mouse are represented accurately or reasonably accurately in the moves of the cursor on the screen. OK, so that's up, down, left and right. We're just saving the new values for the coordinate if they've been changed there. The final one is the fire buttons. So we're only testing fire button one here, left mouse here. As I say, you could just copy this for right. Um, when the fire button is pressed, we are setting a fire down flag here. And um, the idea is that our game code or whatever, our program example, will clear that once it's been processed. But the second one is a fire held. And this is if the fire button is held down. And that's how we're doing our drag function. So we're setting both here. But as soon as the fire button is released, we're clearing fire held. But fire down will be cleared by the routine that's processing the action. So uh, in this case, the routine that draws the chibi code. So that's how our fire is being done there. And then once we've done that, we return. Now, you can see here, because we're in an interrupt handler, we're using the shadow registers here. That's very important. Otherwise, the interrupt handler would corrupt our regular registers and all kinds of crazy things would happen. So we can't use IX and IY here, but we, try, we need to kind of try and keep this as simple as possible anyway. So there we go. That's the code that's handling the processing of the joystick. And those are the variables that are being updated by it. Now, you can see there's this show spike routine. The show sprite function itself will show the cursor to the screen. Show sprite B can be used to draw other things to the screen. Our cursor here is this crosshair. The blob that's used for dragging is this one here. And then the Chibiko character is just here. So those are the three sprites this uses, and they are all drawn with show sprite or show sprite B. OK, so that's how we're processing the movements. But how do we actually make the graphics work when we're drawing things to the screen? Well, we've got this main loop here, which is handling the drawing routine for processing the changes to the cursor position, drawing the cursor on the screen, and also drawing the sprite on the screen with the Chibi Curve sprite, things like that. Now, just as we start, we need to start show the initial position of the cursor here. But this is the main loop. And the first thing we're doing is we're checking if the fire button is pressed. And that should say no fire, not mo fire. It's a bit weird. That's better, no fire. So first we're checking if fire's down. And if fire is down, then we're going to show the Chibiko character here, test sprite two. And we're showing it to the screen here. And that's the size of that sprite. And then we're clearing that fire button, because otherwise we'd keep drawing Chibikos. And if we kept drawing Chibikos, they would flicker on and off. Because as I said before, if we draw a sprite in the same position twice, it will be removed. See, you can see it's being removed because I'm hot. And now, oh my god, what a mess. So yeah, we don't want to do that. So uh, it, that's why we need to clear the fire button. And that's the sort of quirk of XOR. And it, as I say, it's, it's very fast, but it does cause weird corruptions. So um, there we go. So that's how we're drawing our Chibiko. So that's the main individual click routine. 
Then the other thing we've got here is the actual cursor movement. We're loading the old position of the cursor, the last time the sprite was drawn to the screen, the cursor sprite, and the new position, and then we're doing a subtraction to compare them. Now, if the result is zero, then the cursor hasn't moved, and that means we don't need to do anything. And so we're just skipping all the way up here because we, we aren't going to do any more. We don't need to update the position of the sprite on the screen because it's not moved. If it has moved, then we load in the old position of the cursor, and we show the sprite again in that position. And remember XOR, showing the same sprite where it already is will clear it off the screen and it will leave the background intact because of the way, of the way XOR works. We then update the old position of the sprite to the current position of the sprite for the next iteration of this loop. And then we show the sprite to the new location of the cursor and that will update it and show the new cursor. The final thing we're doing here is we're checking if fire is held. And if it's not, then we're skipping down here and we're just starting the loop again. But if it is held, then we're showing the drag sprite and that's what we're doing here. And so that is showing the drag sprite every time the cursor moves. It's not repeatedly showing it if it hasn't moved, because if the cursor hasn't moved, then we're skipping all of this code up here. And remember, as I say, the, clear, the fire flag is cleared here. The held flag is not cleared because otherwise the, the hold wouldn't work. So that's how this routine is working. And um, this is a fairly um, ac acceptable example, I think. I think it works quite nicely. The um, input works as well as I know how to make it. And um, we've shown off how to read um, individual clicks and drags and things. And um, that might be what you need for your game. It was what I needed for my game, although I did add right mouse functionality as well. Anyway, that's all we're going to be covering today. So that's the mouse on the Amstrad CPC. And hopefully we're going to be coming back later on and looking at mouse reading on other systems as well, because hopefully I'll be able to port my game to other systems. We can only hope. Anyway, um, as always, you can go to my website. You can download the source code for today's example, and you can have some fun with the mouse on your Amstrad CPC. Um, hopefully, if you've liked what you've seen, you'll like and subscribe, and that means you'll see all the videos that come up later. And um, hopefully I'll get that game finished so you'll be able to see that as well and I'm hoping it should be quite impressive anyway. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video today please consider supporting my content. It takes 20 to 30 hours a week to keep making these videos. It's basically all I do when I'm not doing my day job and it's only through the support of my patrons and the other sponsors that I'm able to continue Justify doing it essentially. You can back me on Patreon. I post a weekly update with the latest work on the current projects I'm doing. You can see one here and also the newest videos. There's a large backlog of videos that are currently only available to the patrons, although they will all be available to everyone later on. And also it's the backers who I ask when it comes to making decisions on how to change the content in the future, what new content to create and things like that. You can see there was recently a survey of the backers so I can plan next year's content. As well as Patreon, you can now become a member of my channel on YouTube. There's a join button you should see just below this video. You can use that. YouTube backers get the same content as Patreon. I just post it through the YouTube interface instead of the Patreon. It's the same content every week. Also, if you prefer, you can go to my Teespring store and you can get some Chibi Akamas merchandise or some Learn ASM merchandise if you prefer, if that's how you would like to back me. Links for all three are in the description of this video below. Uh, anyway, whatever you decide to do, I hope you've really enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.